Hey, what's up, everybody? Look, we are uh, having a conversation today with Dr. Andy Yarborough from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Go Tigers. Uh, Red stick. Yep. Yep. Go Tigers. So, uh, but we are here today to have a conversation um, about gender identity. Uh, Obviously, one of the hottest topics in our country and in the world is sexuality. And there's a lot of beliefs, ideas, studies, uh, you name it. Uh, going on with uh, with the conversations of sexuality. And so, you know, as a church, we are in a series called Redeeming Sexuality right now. And uh, we've been talking about biological sex. Uh, we, uh, this week, are going to be talking about gender identity. And so in preparation for that, and also as a resource uh, for future conversations and um, uh, to kind of help us process through uh, gender and gender identity, Thought it'd be great to have Dr. Andy with us. And so, uh, so excited you're here, man. Thank you for saying yes. Man, uh, thank you for asking me, especially for a topic like this. And it's a sacred, sacred topic. Um, so, bro, thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. Well, uh, let's kind of jump in. We've got some notes and some questions that we're going to work through. And we're just going to kind of let the conversation go where it needs to go. Uh, but you know, like I said, we're, we're consumed with this conversation about sexuality and, uh, about the separation between biological sex and gender and orientation, sexual orientation, uh, or attraction. And so, you know, uh, obviously everybody starts with presuppositions in conversations like this. And as, as Christians, we have presuppositions and, and ideas that are shaped by our belief in God, our belief in scripture. And so, you know, for us, uh, we believe that God created the heavens and the earth, right? He created the cosmos and everything in it. And his original design was good. It was optimal for human flourishment. Um, and so when it comes to our sexuality, the, the biological sex, uh, you know, and uh, gender identity and, and all of these things and orientation was all aligned. But then through the fall, sin affected every part of you know, creation. And part of that is our sexuality. And so now those, those three areas of our sexuality that comprised our sexuality are, you know, the way that I kind of explain it and talk about it is those things have been fractured. And, you know, you, you think whenever something's been fractured, it, it's, it's all aligned and then it's just, it's just off a little bit. And so then you have this, you know, uh, you have all of these scenarios and all these situations that are coming out of that. Uh, the number one would be, you know, biological sex, that there's obviously uh, two sex cells, male and female. Uh, and so whenever you start having this conversation about is sex binary, uh, it goes directly into uh, the conversation about, well, there's it's not that clear because there's intersex people, you know. And so because of that, it sort of destabilizes this idea that sex is binary. And so then it kind of bleeds into the conversation about gender and this maybe even a bigger separation between gender identity and biological sex and our world's kind of separating all these ideas. And then, you know, when it comes to gender expression and sexual orientation, it's just, it's kind of just basically whatever you want it to be nowadays. Right. And not that it's anything new completely, of course, we'll get into that, but I guess just from you, Dr. Andy, what is your approach? Uh, How do you approach the topic of sex identity orientation from a like a psychological perspective and and also yourself being a christian how does that kind of play out for you well man (laughs) (laughs) it's a very (laughs) open-ended question (laughs) take it where you will (laughs) well so as a christ follower okay everything actually starts with my with my faith and i appreciate science i love science I think that our culture is um, has actually chunked science in favor of ideology. Uh, but as a as a Christian, as a Christ follower, you know, I think where a lot of this actually starts is actually with the scriptures. What do I actually believe about the scriptures? This may not be a might not be a popular opinion, but I really don't care what people do. If people are consenting. If, if adults are, could say, I, I'm not interested in getting into the business or the lives of other people. What I'm interested in is the standard by which our lives are lived, the, the standard by which meaning is assigned to our experiences. 
And as a Christ follower, I look to the scriptures and go, are these worthy of attention regarding an issue as sacred as sexuality? And the answer is yes. And, and I think that, you know, there's plenty of literature that shows why the scriptures are the most reliable document in all of antiquity, mm -hmm. why they're trustworthy. And it doesn't mean we get it right all the time, but, you know, you come back to the scriptures and start thinking through, like, well, what do the scriptures say about same-sex relationships? And a conversation that often gets left out isn't just the, you know, people talk about the Greek words and they'll talk to you and say, hey, look, the scriptures, uh, when they talk about same-sex relationships, they're really talking about dominating relationships, abusive relationships. The scriptures don't actually address consensual same-sex relationships. And I, that's actually not true. Dr. Preston Spring Sprinkle wrote a great a short article addressing that. Um, the scriptures do address those things. But for me, it's beyond just the, the Greek words and the context. It's a theology of precedence. And when you think about the design of a heavenly father, his design and desire for the world, you think that, that um, long-term relationships are between a, a man and a woman. And we'll get into the different, different kinds of experiences. Um, and when sin impacted that, it really screwed us up as people. And so, you know, that is, that starts my approach. And then I lean into the, the science and the literature on it. And I'll refer to this more, but Dr. Deborah So, uh, last name is S O H. She is not a Christian. Let me just be very clear about this. If you get into her book, the end of gender and the research that she's done as a sexologist, you realize that she is not a Christ follower, but what she's found is she's partnered with Christians way more because she's really been kicked out of academia because um, the literature and the research that she presents does not line up with the ideology of what's currently happening in our culture. So, um, you know, I look at it from the lens of my faith in the scriptures. I look at it through the lens of science. And then I look at it through the lens of uh, meeting people where they are in their human experience. You know, so much of who I am and what I do, you know, you, as soon as you say, oh, I, I don't agree with the meaning you've assigned to the experience, people just assume that you're um, homophobic and you hate people who are transgendered. And it's like, good Lord, I really, we don't, I don't personally care what you do as an adult, mm -hmm. but I want your life to flourish. And if we're going to have a conversation about spiritual formation, let's have some conversations about how you navigate these experiences and the meaning that are being ex ex assigned to those experiences. And I will get in the trenches of life with you. Um, for me, it's called incarnational living. Christ shows up in our mess as the church. We show up in the mess of the world, not just in sexuality, but in every area. And we walk with people through that process. So, um, I think big picture, uh, and we can dive into any of that, but that's how I, uh, how, how I approach this. But I do want to just say from the very beginning, sex is binary. S biological sex is not on a continuum. Um, the, the literature supports it. The research also actually supports that gender is not purely a sociocultural construct. So for anybody hearing that, and they're like, what in the heck are you talking about? the current narrative is that sex is a, you get people that say sex is on a continuum because of intersex, but even from an evolutionary perspective, that's impossible. You can't consider outliers or as, as to, and make statements about the norm. Most intersex people can actually uh, procreate. So even right. from an evolutionary perspective, it, right. it doesn't really line up. You know, it's XX, XY. Um, and then, you obviously have deviations or outliers because of that. And we would say our bodies just aren't aligned. We get new bodies when we see him face to face, but, but big picture, sex is binary. It's male, female. Um, gender is binary. It's male, female. And, uh, and it, while there are sociocultural factors to gender, for example, there are social factors that play a role in the expression of, of masculinity and femininity, right. the gender expression of male, female, it's actually, 
there's literature that suggests that it's testosterone exposure in utero that determines how people or what people pursue in regarding to masculine or feminine. Right. Um, and so there's, so it's not purely sociocultural factors. Um, and what, what really gets me is you'll say people, you know, it, it, they'll say, oh, gender exists on a continuum, masculinity, femininity exists on a continuum. You can be whatever you want. But then you see people clearly gravitating towards one and calling it a continuum, but they're doing things that are fully embraced as either masculine or feminine in the cultures. And there's trying to blend the two. That doesn't mean it mm -hmm. actually exists on a continuum. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think, I think it'd be important to, to kind of take each piece because, uh, you know, underneath gender as like subcategories, you have, you have gender, you have gender I identity, you have gender expression, uh, gender roles, uh, uh, gender stereotypes. You have, yeah. you know, you have, and, and so whenever you're, you're getting specific and talking about gender, I find that it's such a broad, because of all those subcategories, it's such a, it's, it's, it's like, you know, saying gender, it's like, what, what do you, what do you mean by that? Whenever you're saying that? And so whenever you say that gender is binary, um, I guess, do you think of gender identity, gender expression, gender, all of it separately, or do you just approach it as one law? What's the distinction between sex and gender for you? Well, um, for me, sex is purely biological. It's purely biological. For me, gender is biological, but there are sociocultural factors regarding the expression of what's masculine, feminine, and what we gravitate towards in terms of gender expression. Um, like back in the day, men used to wear high heels, right? Yeah. Um, so it, I don't think most men, especially in South Mississippi, ain't nobody wearing high heels. The most we get is a pair no. of cowboy boots, <laughs> <laughs> right? But nobody is... Um, you know, n no man's walking around with high heels on, for example. And so when you talk about gender expression, people will say things like it's on, oh, it's on a continuum, but it's like, is it, they, there are multiple genders. It's like, well, really? Because if I'm a man identifying as a woman and I'm talking about that gender expression, what am I tending to gravitate towards? I'm tending to gravitate towards the binary aspects or blend these aspects of these binary components of the cultural expression of gender. So I may cut my hair yeah, short, right? Well, that's typically a masculine. I may shave it off. Well, that's typically masculine. Um, if I move towards makeup or, you know, painting my fingernails, that t that's typically considered feminine. And again, while these are sociocultural um, expressions of how masculinity and femininity, femininity are expressed, they, they're really oscillating between two points, what's male and what's female. Right. And so you can get into gender roles. Okay. Like who does what within culture? And I'm, I'm all for challenging aspects of gender roles. You know, I'm not interested in, in shoving everyone into two, you know, this is your masculine, your male, female, this is your role in society. I don't, I don't think it's that simple and I'm just not interested in doing that. Yeah. My, and, and people are welcome to express themselves however they would like to express themselves. I'm not interested in controlling people doing that either. I just want us to be intellectually honest about the fact that you really can't change biological sex. It's male, female, and there's gender, uh, there's male and female and gender. And all people are really doing is trying to somehow blend the two or express themselves in the opposite way that would, uh, from, a, uh, in the opposite, uh, expression of what people would assume based on their bio, bio biological sex. It's still based on the binary understanding of what's male and female. So I think this is where the rub is as far as the, 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 the conversations that are going on is like, okay, is gender more psychological, uh, than, and by, bi and, uh, biological sex, obviously biological, but gender more of the psychological component 
or how how that biological sex sh normally would play out psychologically and then uh you know internally how someone senses uh or feels about themselves their identity would then it, they then choose how to express that outwardly or externally to the world uh what about what i just said was the pickoff point for you that you were like that's where i differ in how i would explain it well there again there are sociocultural factors to gender culture determines how gender is expressed but biology determines to a large degree for example testosterone exposure in utero for both male and female uh females in the womb the degree to which that that individual will pursue the masculine or feminine expressions within culture. So while culture will say this is what's masculine and this is what's feminine, what happens in utero has a lot to say about how that individual will pursue or what that individual will pursue. So for example, if you have a feminine man, right? It is in that, that individual, let's say he's a, is a homosexual, has a homosexual orientation, identifies as gay. Um, and that, that individual pursues more feminine, culturally feminine, um, expressions within his culture. There's a high likelihood that he experienced less testosterone in utero, which shaped his brain development to pursue more feminine aspects of culture. It doesn't matter what those are within the context of culture. And we see this in the literature. So again, I understand there's an ideology that wants to support people. And I'm, as Christians, we should not be interested at all in the oppression of other people, but we need to be intellectually honest about what's going on in the process of this rather than just pushing an ideology or an overreaction to that, to that, to, to oppression, what people have felt people, right. We've got to be honest and stay honest about this stuff. So you'd say when it comes to, uh, and I'll, I'll put it like this. Our culture says that because a, let's say it's a biological male, uh, because that biological male is, uh, per, uh, prefers more culturally feminine things, whether that be clothes or activities. Uh, it's typically kind of comes down to that overall, right? Uh, uh, clothes activities, maybe, maybe attraction on top of that, you know, homosexuality or whatever that, that the, the, the current gender ideology pushes the idea that they then maybe they are not a male. Maybe they should look at potentially right. changing their gender identity right. as opposed to uh, what I've heard a lot of even um, uh, homosexuals say, like older homosexuals say, guys, listen, y'all are pushing these young homosexual people to change genders Yes, whenever they're just gay, leave them alone. Yes. Do, uh, what, what, when I say that, and again, that's not me making that up. There, there's whole um, – uh, gay uh, organizations that are, are saying this, like, man, this movement is taking way too many liberties and pushing this, this change your whole gender identity thing. And they're like, it's screwing kids up. Yeah. Whereas they're just gay, leave them alone. What, what would you say to that? I would agree. Uh, the, the, the gay community and I, I know a lot of gay men and women who are upset with the current ideological frameworks particularly in how they are pushing young uh, boys and girls into uh, medical transition. Right. Uh, I, I, I believe that in the next decade, we're going to see a significant backlash against what we're doing to our children medically right now. We already are. There are Reddit, um, Reddit communities with tens of thousands of people who are, detran um, who are detransitioning and having to live with the lifelong consequences of what doctors and families did to them, what culture has done to them at a bio on a physical level in the name of an ideology. Right. And, and look, 
Christians are up in arms about it, but so is the LG, so is the LGBT community too. Some of the LGBT, but a lot of the right. people who identify as gay, lesbian, they're up in arms about this. Well, and you see, even in uh, the UK, you see a uh, an undoing of certain things, even in the educational yes. system. Yes, where they're trying to uh, kind of pull the plug on gender ideology, being you know gender education uh, in regards to what we're talking about right now. Not yep. necessarily about general sex and things like that. You know, it's kind of more the biology, normal biological conversations there. But um, but in regards to what we just described, so uh, but although al although that's not always the case because you know there are people who, let's say they're born a man, they transition to a woman, but yet they are still uh, uh, dating other women. You know, and so it's not always that they're necessarily a same sex attracted and, right. you know, so what, what would you say to maybe those situations? This is the, st we're trying to, our culture says, don't label me, but then we try to give an infinite number of labels to people's experiences instead of just describing mm. what the experience actually is saying what you are regarding male, female, as your sex, as your biological sex, as your gender, and then learning how to talk about your experiences, the reality of what you're experiencing, rather than just assigning a meaning to it. Oh, okay. I'm non-binary. Um, oh, I'm a trans. I'm a you know I'm a transgendered male. I'm a transgendered homosexual male. It's like what does that? most people have no idea what that means. And even the sand underneath the culture that understands it is always shifting. Right. And it's like, Hey, no, you're, you're a, a biological female, um, who's drawn to more masculine male things. You're, and let's talk about that experience. What's right. really going on with you. And you know, there's a difference between, you know, gender dysphoria is a is a diagnosis where people experience a significant amount of distress um related to um related to the experiences of being like you know trapped in yeah um trapped in a body that is not really theirs trapped in a body where they're born the opposite gender and so there's this marked incongruence between what they feel they are versus their uh, assigned uh gender at birth <laughs> Right. So, or, or so biological say, sex say, at birth. Right. <laughs> yeah, so they would say sex, sex assigned at birth, right? Yeah. Sex assigned at birth. So, and, and there's a great grace and, and, um, compassion that needs to be given to people who are wrestling with that. It's got to be right. persistent, which is part of the problem of people transitioning. Most of the time, kids are going to grow out of any gender confusion they actually have. So if they've been transitioned right. already bi biologically or physically, those kids are screwed. Yeah, the, the stats are really overwhelming when it comes to that, about how many, I mean, it's it's 80%, I believe, of people who are, uh, I, I believe it's diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Uh, 80% by the age of, it's either 18 or 21. Uh, don't hold me to the exact, you know, thing. But anyway, uh, you know, grow out of it. Yep. Uh, and and out of that, it, it is like another 80% of that number um, are, are homosexual. And so yeah. you, you start trying to look at the data in order to sort of understand, okay, if there wasn't a gender ideology that's being pushed like it is in the last couple of generations – where would we be as an as a country like and, and as a world would would there be such uh such a push that ends up in hormonal hormone therapy uh extreme hormone therapy not that not that there aren't people who who do need some you know they need therapy they need help in this area but but then whenever you get to sex reassignment surgery you know and then uh, and i i actually I, i'm kind of like you in regards to Hey, we are in a free country, and if uh, grown adults want to live life, however, and it's and it's legal, it's a free country, so you can do, you know. Um, I, I, but the thing that's really inflamed this is the the obsession with pushing this down into young people's minds. Yeah, 
that's the thing for me that um, even last year, you know, I kind of mentioned this, but uh, there were some events that were going on in our community. And it was like, listen, full grown adults that want to do things with each other. Hey, OK. But whenever we as as local news outlets and people that I know are, are saying family friendly environments and there is sexual uh, you know, activities happening and it's always men <laughs> You know, and some of these drag show type things, it's, it's men dressed as women wanting to dance and do performances in front of children. They want to read their books in front of children. It's like you start looking at it and you're like, man, what is this leading to? Where, where are we headed? And so, you know, in one sense, it's like, hey, these are adults. You can do what you want. But whenever it starts getting pushed down to children, uh, and it's all in the name of compassion and wanting them to grow up in a better world than the, than the previous generation did as far as being able to express themselves. You know, I, m my daughter, a couple years ago, she was three years old. She came home and she said she was a boy. She said, I'm a boy. And I was like, oh, baby, you're not a boy. You're a girl. And she was like, no, I'm a boy. And I was like, what makes you say that? And she didn't have an answer. She's three. You know, she almost four. And, uh, and I said, no, you're a girl. You know, there's boys and there's girls. And that was the last time that it ever got brought up. And I'm not sitting here indoctrinating my kid to be a girl. It, but here's we're in, when an, an ideology is being pushed, whenever children come home and say even something as simple as that, it's looked at in a way that's like, oh, maybe they are trying to say something. And then, you know what, if you feed that, it will grow into more than just a three or four year old saying something. I could have raised my, my children and think that they were birds or anything. I mean, we're, the mind of children are so um, impressionable, right? Well, we see it so, in, the, in furry culture. Yes, exactly. Right, kids literally identify as an animal. It's like, what? Like, guys, we're. And it's being protected yeah. now under things like even like title nine and all this people don't understand these laws are expanding to protect to protect these kids who are, who are saying this yeah. from you know not from being told you're not an animal right you know what we call you know you talked about exposing kids and men dressing up in drag and exposing it to sexualized dances and things you know what we call exposing children to sexual content sex abuse sexual mm. abuse even exposing children to pornography is considered sexual abuse. And a lot of this is even connected to some of the required readings or recommended readings coming down into our school systems. Mel and I had issue um, with our, our current school. There's a book um, called, uh, I forget the name of it, but it, it wrote a lot about um, uh, child sexual abuse, trafficking, and all in, the, all in the name of creativity and expression, which if you want to write about that, and that's part of, okay, that's fine. But I don't want my child, my 10-year-old, my 13-year-old picking up a book, reading explicit language about what happens during child sexual abuse and calling it art or calling it expression or hmm. good literature. Uh, and so there's a lot, and, and I don't necessarily want to connect that to a conversation, which I realize it sounds like I am. I, I think more than anything, it's it's a broader cultural conversation about human sexuality and the same culture from an ideological perspective that's promoting a lot of the identity-based stuff instead of just helping people talk about their experiences. What are you really experiencing? Giving people a place to say it out loud and go, okay, well, let's just see how this works out as you get older. Let's see how it right. works out. Look, you people can make fun of me all day long. There's things that I do that are absolutely feminine. Mm -hmm. um, I I enjoy shopping periodically, and in our current culture, oh. you know, like really, okay, that's fair. I <laughs> I will shave the le the hair off of my arms and legs every summer. Really? Yes. Not that anyone well in the church wanted to know this. <laughs> what's the uh, what, what's the purpose of that? What, I like, just, just do like the way it it's feels. So hot, I like the way it feels. I don't sweat as much, especially if I'm at the beach. I'm not rinsing stuff off. And at some point, I quit caring about what other people thought. There you go. That's absolutely considered feminine. 
do I identify right. as a woman? No. And so, but when children do things that move in this direction and we're forcing them into, no, you have to identify this way instead of going time right. out guys. Yeah. Help us understand, you know, the thing, the power of just giving a language to our experiences and being given the freedom to do that is called confession. Hmm. It's a core Christian practice. And it's not just sin, because a lot of these experiences that we're having, the reason they're not getting talked about is not because it's actually sin. It's because we don't know how to deal with it. We don't know how to yeah. hold the tension. We don't know. Right. And so the more that we're able to help people get out loud, this is my experience. Okay. Culture will give a meaning to that experience. But if culture is going to be allowed an opportunity to give a meaning, why don't we also allow something that is transcultural, transgenerational to speak into that thing as well? And it's the scriptures. Yeah. And so, you know, navigating this thing as the church can be difficult because you're immediately, your character is immediately attacked. And I believe it's an over response. It's an overreaction to what has been oppressive in the past. Yeah. If you're, if your expression didn't match up and, and for some people still, if it doesn't match up with a, either a preconceived or culturally acceptable, um, uh, in a way, then it is, it's wrong. Um, yeah. You know, and and I, I believe in that aspect. We said it earlier. You know, there's a lot of lines that do change. Um, you could take. Oh, we said the high heel thing. We said. You know, I think it was 1918. Uh, actually, there's an article you could read about how pink used to be a manly color and blue was a was a was a womanly color. Or, yeah. You know, girly and boy, uh, boy, it was it was swapped up. And at some point in history, it changed to where nowadays boy represent. I mean, blue represents boy. And pink represents girl. What happened? Culture changed. And so th th there's, there's an argument that people make to say, you know, well, the whole masculine feminine thing is it's so fluid, right? It, it and I don't mean that like in a gender fluid way. I just mean that in a literal, it's fluid. It changes over time. And so, uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, like you said earlier, it doesn't mean that because you consider something or you you have an affinity for something that's considered more feminine if you're a male that then you should begin to question your gender identity i was listening to a a lady she's a um she's a homosexual and she was talking about her her experience in life and she's about she's probably 35 maybe four years old she was like what happened to just being a tomboy she's yeah. like what happened to that she's like i get told all the time yeah. by people that that maybe I'm really a guy. And she's like, I'm not a guy. I just I'm a uh, like growing up, I was a tomboy, and that was fine. I've, I'm I'm perfectly fine. She's like, but this this idea is getting pushed on me all the time that I'm I look like I'm in an early transition phase. People are saying, oh well, you're just an early transition phase now. Let Let's talk about the masculine feminine. The culture says it just shifts, but it actually doesn't. Not okay. there are peripheral things that shift, but there are aspects of the masculine and feminine that are all in God. And, right. and those things are, there are qualities that are universally seen throughout every culture that God imparted to the male and God imparted to the female. For example, when you, and, and, it, and it comes back to Christ and the church, which is again, another aspect of this. So things that have been historically cross-culturally, transgenerationally okay. male are m the masculine initiates provides and produces protects leads and there's a functional strength there that comes back to initiation that is okay historically across every culture over time you see these aspects of the masculine it doesn't mean that women can't do that Many women right. have to step up and do that, right? It just says these are masculine characteristics. If you notice, every one of those represent Christ. When you look at what's feminine, what's feminine tends to receive. They tend to steward. They tend to nurture. 
the feminine uh, advises and helps, um, and there's a beauty in the feminine, hmm. which perpetuates the receiving. And these line up, the initiation and the receiving, the production and the stewardship of the production, the protection and the nurturing, the leadership and the advisory committee, the help and the functional strength and the beauty. That is the church. And so when they come together, marriage, for example, represents Christ and the church. And one aspect of that is the representation of the masculine and the feminine, which is a little bit of a different conversation than gender, right? And male, yeah. female. But those are represented in the masculine and those are represented in the feminine. They, are there some details that shift over time, like pink? Yes. Yeah. Understandably so. But you see these qualities throughout all of history in the masculine and the feminine. And again, it doesn't mean that men can't be feminine. In fact, there are aspects that need balance. So men, masculine, are typically a little more masculine, but they need to also know how to operate in the feminine to be a healthy person. Yeah. Women need to be able to operate in the feminine, but also operate periodically in the masculine to be a healthy person. So I need to be able to receive. I need to be able to steward, to nurture, to advise and help, and to appreciate beauty and to, and to resonate that as the church, as an attraction to non-believers. There needs to be hmm. a gentleness in my approach. I don't have to be at war all the time. But these expressions are really important. And so when you think about, again, it goes back to the fact that just because these may blend a bit or because the culture says there's multiple genders, th there's not. There's the relationship right. between two aspects of these things. And what people are trying to do is merge the expression within the context of culture and call it a continuum. There's two genders. Both genders carry core attributes okay and those attributes can be expressed both masculine and feminine attributes can be expressed by males and can be expressed by females and i think mm -hmm. that's what culture tends to misunder to not to, to 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 um confuse right so men are expected to to embody the masculine aspects of God, of Jesus. Women are expected to embody the feminine qualities of the church, which, again, the biblical connection there. But on an individual basis, men can lean towards the feminine, right? M women can lean towards, like your, the, your, your, the lady uh, said, what happened to tomboys? Right. Like back in my, I'm, I'll be 45 this month. When I was growing up, there was a you know girl, short hair, running around. You couldn't tell if they were a boy or girl. No one in their right mind was like, "Hey, you're a transgendered individual." Right now, there now, honestly, most of those women grew up and married heterosexual marriages. There's a, a couple that are are lesbian, identify as lesbians. So, yeah, I think whew. exposing, exposing the ideology, exposing the, the train of thought, uh, exposing the logic behind it. Uh, and, and in that you could begin to kind of contrast the spirit behind it. Um, but whenever everything is narrative driven and emotionally driven, uh, you know, it, it gets hard to do that because people are like, but yeah, that that's gonna, if you say that that's going to hurt their feelings. And it's like, oh, you know, kind of believe that not saying it's actually going to hurt their, their existence. Well, as the church. So this right. is, this is my response to that. Um, before you say anything, ask questions and listen to understand, to understand someone's experience, to understand where they're coming from, where you can say it back to them and they go, you get it to validate yeah. their experience is not the same thing as agreeing with it. It's not. And I think what gets people is the ideological aspects of culture says, oh, that's your experience. That's who you are. I'll validate you. I'll also tell you what it means. So if we, mm. if we go straight to that's not you, 
that's not who you are. It, it's, it is an invalidation of someone's experience. And look, I know that we have to die to ourselves. I, I, there are aspects that doesn't mean we sacrifice the core self. The, the core self is alive again in Christ Jesus. Once we're saved, we're justified. And that core self has to participate in our sanctification. So when the scriptures say deny yourself, it's talking more about the flesh or the things in our lives that are going to destroy us. So there are aspects of our life that need to go in the grave. But in Christ, everything that goes in the grave comes out alive again. But who is denying themselves? Who's denying? The individual. I can't do it for that individual. And so Mm -hmm. they have to know what they're denying. They have to understand the experience. They've got to be able to lay that down, knowing why they're laying that thing down. So the more that we're able to give people a language for their experience, the more they're able to understand what they're actually laying down or, or picking up if they choose to do that. But there's a, a, mm-hmm. a better integration of that experience, which helps them process that more effectively. If they're just shoving those experiences away, gender dysphoria, um, uh, uh, same-sex attraction they don't know what to do with, they are exiling parts of themselves that actually need to come to the table of life, have a conversation, understand what's really going on, invite that part to Jesus as, as Christians. If, if somebody's like, I'm not a Christian, then none of this conversation, not none, but a lot of this conversation is going to be hard to apply, right? We're talking specifically yeah. to Christians and specifically to Christians who are living with these experiences. But So, yeah, okay, so you're talking about how to... Um how to how to kind of in interact with you know someone who is is dealing with uh gender identity issues or uh you know their biological sex not matching who they feel that 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 they are or maybe it's mixed in with that it's some sexual orientation uh there's just a lot going on in somebody's life i think hearing from you how do you engage with people as a as a psychologist how do you validate them and work through maybe, I mean, do you work through past trauma? Do you, do you work through what's going on? Is there even some, with some people, is there anything even to work through? Is it just, they, that's just how they feel and kind of what does it look like? And, and then also, I guess, kind of attached to this, how do you, how do you balance the significance of biological factors that might be, you know, kind of playing into it, whether it be, uh, you know, hormonal things that are going on, or maybe some chromosomal, uh, chromosomal v- variations or physical, you know, I don't know if maybe you've had to deal with some, some of those, those issues, f- people with physical abnormalities and, and whatnot. Uh, so how do you balance that with what's going on psychologically yeah. in their life? Well, whenever I bring in the biological conversations, it's a lot of times to help people understand that they didn't cause this that they you know the church has such a big oh you're not born this way well i mean they kind of are a lot of people are (laughs) actually you know we're talking out of both sides of our mouth if we're like hey you're born in sin but you're not born that way it's like come on man (laughs) um i think we died on that hill for far too long and it's just it's just the wrong hill it's it um yeah i agree because you know we're born with predispositions and all sorts of things. And the literature even suggests that like, again, go back to the testosterone, testosterone exposure in utero has, has a, there's a a correlation there between not just gender identity issues, but, um, sexual orientation experiences. So it's like to say that it's, you're not born that way it's missing the point one of even what it means to be born separated from God. Our body's not the way they're supposed to be predisposed in a number of ways. So most of the time it's like, Hey, you didn't ask for these experiences unless there's some kind of sexual abuse and the sexual abuse arouse things in them. And so they're going back over and over and over to these same sex relationships to try to get authority over the abuse. Right. Mm. But you can assume that everybody in our current culture who identifies as gay or lesbian or some aspect of gender identity or dysphoria or whatever, you can't assume that they have a terrible relationship with their father. You can't necessarily assume right. that there's been some sex abuse. 
those are questions yeah. that you got to build relationships with people and have conversations with them about. So, you know, I, I'm asking questions. I'm getting to know people in session. The honest, honestly, most, most of the LGBTQ plus community that I do work with, it's not about that at all. They're coming in because some other factors happening in their life. And, you know, once we talk through that and I get to understand and know people, most people that I work with, they, they, they've, felt these experiences where there's gender issues or sexual issues for as long as they've known. Right. For them, it's not separate or it didn't develop like a symptom over time. It's integrated into their experiences yeah. of life. So, right. but for the people who are really wrestling with this, like, I don't know what to do with these experiences. I identify as a Christ follower. I believe Jesus got out of the grave, but I'm ready to live. I, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep fighting anymore. I can't stay celibate anymore. Um, I help them, number one, give a language to their experiences. And what I mean by that is there's a difference between experience and identity. So in sexual orientation, it really is, hey, do you have same-sex experiences? Because uh, some people can have same-sex experiences, engage in same-sex behaviors, and they not have a homosexual orientation. It's just same-sex behaviors, and our culture supports that periodically, especially among women, right? Katy Perry's like, kiss a girl right. and I like it. Hope my boyfriend don't mind it. It's like yeah. that same-sex behavior. You can have same-sex attraction. Doesn't mean anything about your orientation. You can have a homosexual or bisexual orientation, meaning you're predominantly attracted to people of the same sex, or you're attracted to both equally, or you're attracted to both. Um, and, and that's an orientation. All of that is an experience. It means nothing about who you actually are. It's just an experience. And so I try to really understand what it means because at one point I had one guy come in. He was like, I think I'm gay. And I'm like, well, okay. So when have you noticed an attraction to a sexual attraction to men? He goes, what? I'm not attracted to men. I said, well, huh. I said, well, um, what, what makes you think you're gay? And he said, well, I wear skinny jeans. I'm like, <laughs> That's how confused he was on what was yeah. really going on. Um, I said, no, bro, you're not a homosexual. You're a metrosexual. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, but so understanding that the, the LGBTQ plus whatever is actually an identifier that's been more politically motivated than it has anything else. Mm. And so... The culture just says, no, you have any kind of same-sex experience, this is who you are. You have any kind of a gender dysphoric experience, or not. maybe it doesn't even have to be dysphoric. You can have a tomboy experience or an identification with the attributes of the other sex, and whew, you're transgendered. And it's like, time out, guys. Yeah. Like, let's just let people talk about and give them a language for their experience. Help yeah. them process what's really going on. Because as you stated earlier, a lot of these experiences actually um, diminish or go away over time. Now, some don't, yeah. right? Uh, so and we got to recognize that. So a lot of what I'm doing is helping people give a language. Then I help people identify the source of meaning with which they most agree and the source of meaning they're going to use to assign meaning to their experiences. So what, is, what does that mean? Like, in a like one example, so culture, and I'll have this conversation. Culture will tell you that you're a lesbian, you're gay, you're bisexual, transgender, queer, um, f non-binary, fill in the blank. And what do you think culture is basing those identity assignments upon your meaning, uh, your experience? If you experience it, it must be true and their own validation. If you identify, it validates my identification. Well, that's very dangerous. Hmm. Because as a psychologist, psychology talks out of both sides of its mouth. They'll say, oh, if you experience this, that's who you are. But no, if you experience suicidality, no, you can't do that. Just because you experience the right. desire to die doesn't mean you should have the right to. 
Yeah. Just because you experience negative thoughts about your worthlessness, that doesn't mean it's true. We call that mood congruent cognition, and it's not objectively true, meaning yeah. any thoughts that line up with your uh, emotional states. And okay. so it's like, guys, we're talking out of both sides of our mouth here. There's a standard by which you're operating that says no if you have a worthless thought that doesn't mean you are worthless. Okay, where does that standard come from? Where does the standard come from that says if you experience same-sex attraction, you should identify as gay? That determines who you are. Mm -hmm. If you are drawn to feminine things, that means you're a transgendered female. Actually, what if it means you're a gay male and you're drawn to feminine things? Like, like but there's more, there's more options than there's, just the one. There's more <laughs> options than just shoving people into these, right? But I'll, for the people who are also Christians who really are wrestling, but it's like, hey, but if we're going to give culture an opportunity to do this, what if we gave the scriptures an opportunity as well? What if we mm -hmm. revisited the scriptures because they're transgenerational. I think it was G.K. Chesterton. I don't, maybe not, but that's the name coming to mind that says the, the scriptures are our eternal contemporary. Hmm. Just because they're old. C.S. Lewis, it call it, Lewis calls it chronological snobbery. Just because something is new, we think it's better. And the same is true just because yep. it's old, we think it's better. But if something's old and still relevant, we've got to lean in and pay attention because human nature doesn't really change across time. Yeah. So what if we give the scriptures an opportunity to speak to who we are even outside of the context of our sexuality? And what does that mean for how I express and live that thing out? And we walk with people through it. Now, if people want to go and express themselves and live a homosexual or a gay lifestyle or identify, they have the freedom to do that. I'm not talking right. them out of it. What I am doing as a psychologist is helping them navigate the sources of meaning and operate out of their own sense of conviction so that they take a next step that feels the most congruent with their lives. Now, Christians sometimes have a hard time with that. But what I would remind mm -hmm. you is Jesus let the rich young ruler walk away. He gave him options, and then he let him go. It's not my job to try to force people into the decisions of how I think they should live their lives. It's my job to give people opportunities and invite the Holy Spirit into that process. And I yeah. guarantee you that those people keep coming back to have conversations with us because they know that we didn't force them into an identity even when we had a conviction. What they will find out is that the ideological factions have forced them into an identity yep. and not given them the real option to work this thing out in their own soul with a God that they know cares about them, loves them at a core level. So that's, that's kind of how I navigate it. And look, if a psychologist, in, if a typical psychologist in my field was hearing me say this stuff, they'd probably lose their minds. Oh, I can't believe yeah. they're not listening psychologists do more evangelizing the, the the psychologists and counselors that tell me I evangelize in the therapy room have no idea what they're talking about. I actually do the opposite. I give good news yeah. and I walk, but I walk with people into their choice. The, 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 the other ideological factions are the ones who are actually evangelizing, doing the very thing they accuse me of doing in the therapy room. Yeah. Every, I, 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 I believe that everybody is bringing, they're importing their beliefs yeah. into their function or whatever they're yep. doing. You can't, it's like a politician. Hey, we don't need politicians who are faith based or any, they need to be just neutral. It's like, that's impossible. Everybody's bringing their presuppositions or their beliefs or their faith to some degree, whatever that faith is, whether it's in themselves or into their own, you know, it doesn't matter. They're importing it into what they're doing. And so, so it's going to happen in every field, even psychology, uh, I guess one of the things I'm, I'm curious as far as uh, we're talking about, if we, if we were to specifically talk about gender dysphoria for a second, um, that's become a very controversial diagnosis. Uh, and if you bring it up, it's it, it feels like it's an invalidating thing to even say to people. Um, 
you know, do you feel like gender dysphoria is a fair diagnosis? If so, like, how do you go about diagnosing this condition? I mean, what are your thoughts around yeah. the, the phrase as a, the diagnosis as a whole? Well, the, the, the rub for people in the LGBTQ plus community is that we assume there's dysphoria. Right. Right. So the, so gender dysphoria is real. It, it's a, it's mm-hmm. an actual like diagnosable condition where there's a significant distress or impairment because of the mismatch between the, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna use cultural language, but the expressed gender of a person versus the assigned sex at birth. Right. But transgender, yeah. tra- transgender is just a word. It's just a, if you're a transgendered individual, it just means you, you, the gender identity that you have doesn't line up with the sex assigned at your birth. It doesn't mean you're distressed or impaired, right? Gotcha. So all, mm-hmm. The only difference is the presence of dysphoria. So just because someone's transgender doesn't mean they have gender dysphoria. What's the difference between gender dysphoria and body dysmorphia? Body, uh, well, on a fundamental level, from my perspective, nothing. Um, but, that would probably, that's probably going to upset some people. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm not, my, my, I'm not trying to <laughs> offend people purposefully, but it's a, yeah. it's a gen, body dysmorphic disorder is when you um, have a delusional uh, perspective of an aspect of your body, dysmorphia, the shape okay. of your body. Um, uh, it's, it's connected to a specific physical part of who you are, right? Something's wrong with me, whatever. Gender dysphoria is the is the psychological experience of of who you are versus what you've been born into. Okay, yeah. So a person who has gender dysphoria could also experience body dysmorphia. Uh, so th- I guess what I'm getting at is is would 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 a person who undergoes yeah, I, sex I, I reassignment got, okay, surgery yeah. I see, be somebody I see who's, who has a combination has a combination of those or like- well matt walsh if you have not seen what is a woman um i, mm-hmm. I would recommend watching this uh watching that because again i i'm not i he, he can be a little combative uh, so i'm not interested in that yeah. right I, i'm not interested in combat i'm interested in just honest conversations but there, there's things in there that it's like i can't believe this so he, you know, they, they will with, with kids perform uh, surgeries, um, where you, for example, if I'm a biological male, I don't want my penis. I feel mm-hmm. like it's in a, it doesn't belong to me. It's an appendage. I want it off now. People right. will say, Hey, take it off. But Matt Walsh brought up, he's like, well, if I don't like my arm and I think my arm mm-hmm. is, is, and I want my arm off. Would you cut my arm off? Well, no. Now, in some not. cases, you actually, there are rare cases where you would cut somebody's arm off and they would feel better. But we don't call that okay. It's still a disorder. Like, it's a, right. something's wrong with the brain, right? It's, something's not. So some people have gotten their, they have gotten an appendage removed, like an arm or a yeah. leg, uh, f- in order to. As the treatment modality, Yes. And they felt better. Wow. And there are people who who are truly transgendered, meaning this isn't a social contagion. They're not doing this because they're hopping on some ideological bandwagon. And you, you, yeah. and you, it happens, and they feel more fully themselves. Right. Okay. Caitlyn Jenner would probably be a a, a good example of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um. He, she, um, there's a true gender dysphoria there. And when the transition happened, caught a lot of flack, but feels more like now what's going on with me lines up with who I am eternally. But that happened later in life as an adult, right? right? So there are people that that happens, but we, we don't say that they're normal, they're okay, and to say that something's wrong isn't a characterological assassination on that person. Right. I'm not attacking that person. I'm not trying to put that person down. I'm just simply saying something's not right. And so 
when you do this with younger kids or teenagers, it's like, guys, what are we doing? Like, let's yeah. help the person psychologically navigate things psychologically and see if the person doesn't come to some greater level of integration over time. Then just as a teen, their prefrontal cortex is, is there isn't even developed fully. Right. Don't do something so permanent like that. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, am I answering your question? Well, so we're, I know we got off on about, some of the, yeah. Do we feel like, uh, you know, or, or how do you go about diagnosing it? I know overall, it has to do with whether um, or not it's a distress. Yeah. And, and how long it's been going yeah. on. So I think uh, that, I think it's right. like six months. It's got to at least be, a. um, it's gotta be a, a congruent distress for, I think at least six months. Yeah. I believe that's, I believe that's what I was reading as well. Um, and so once someone is diagnosed with gender dysphoria, what does it look like as far as you going, uh, you know, helping them? Uh, what does, I mean, what does therapy look like? Or is, what is the goal of it even? Is the goal to come out of gender dysphoria? Is the goal to learn to live with that? Is the goal, like, how do you approach next steps with someone who is experiencing that? And it's very real. Well, I, it, I, I think it depends on the person. Um, you know, some people choose to go the medical route. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're a, if you're an adult and that that is what you've decided to do, then okay, you probably have to go through a psychological assessment to be sure you're not um, that it's it's specifically related to the gender dysphoria. So you know you call them like gender affirming surgeries, and so people can can do that. But there's also um, I mean there's obviously counseling working with that, working with family. Honestly, a lot of times we don't like this in the church, but social transitions, nouns, pronouns, the uses of that, like what feels more congruent with the dysphoria. And that all of that is if somebody is going, I am going to identify as the opposite sex. I have to, I can't do this anymore. But that yeah. comes after these pr other discussions about Hey, I realize there's a dysphoria here. How do we understand the dysphoria and the suffering you feel within the context of the scriptures? If they're saying I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. Right. Um, and so having those conversations about like, Hey, I, I, I will get in the trenches with you regarding this thing. So a lot of that is the counseling, it's therapy, it's spiritual direction, spiritual formation, a lot of spiritual formation for people inviting God into the middle of this pain and struggle, sometimes not to change it, but to be present in it, to speak to us in that. Yeah. But if people are identifying there's, there's, you know, hormone therapies, puberty blockers, gender affirming surgeries, but that wreaks havoc. The, the ideological factions are like, no, let's do this as if the identification, like, but those things just wreak havoc on our bodies. And right. so long term, it increases heart issues. If you're a consenting adult and you want to do it, go, I mean, it's your body. It's a free it's country. A free con <laughs> it's your right. body. Yeah. But that's part of the reason why a lot of times people go through psychological assessments, even before things like um, gastro, uh, uh, like gastro surgeries, right? Or things. Yeah. So, right. Anyway. Well, so. I guess that's a, a, a question if someone or, or have you seen a correlation between people who have um, maybe they're experiencing gender dysphoria uh, or they've been diagnosed with it and it's also connected to other, you know, m mental disorders or other has there, is there any, is there any pattern at all? Or is it just sort of like we said earlier, man, it's, there's just so many variables that really, there's really nothing to speak of when it comes to that kind of well, stuff. Well, it's kind of like which came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, the, the, yeah, the, exactly. the, a lot of the LGBTQ community will say people deal with anxiety and things because they're not accepted for who they are. Right. right. And I, I can understand that point, but that's yeah. not the only reason why people may deal. There may be pre, they may be predisposed to it. 
and it exa- and this issue exacerbates anxiety, depression. There may be existing trauma that's not necessarily related to the to the to the actual gender dysphoria. Um, they, they may have anxiety because of the gender dysphoria because they don't want to identify and they're really struggling with that. I mean, there's, a, I think, a lot of factors yeah. that, um, that impact um, how people work, work through these struggles. But I, I think the biggest point is don't oversimplify this. Don't make assumptions and impose those assumptions on the people in front of you and then think that you know exactly what you're talking about. Listen to understand. Let's kind of shift away from more of like a clinical type of setting and let's get a little bit more personal. Like let's just take a few minutes and talk about family. Okay, I'm a, I'm a mom or I'm a dad and my child that I've raised, you know, is is 16 years old or whatever. And, you know, say it's a boy and I've always noticed they've kind of been a little bit more feminine and that's all, that's okay. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, not a boy. It's just, Hey, they have some feminine tendencies. Uh, we've kind of tried to talk about it a little bit here and there about like, Hey, do you like any girls or whatever? And they just, maybe they're not really interested. It's kind of just like, eh, you know, and, and now all of a sudden they, they come, we're at the dining room table. And my child's sitting across from me crying and like, I've just got to tell you something. And then they say, I think I'm a girl, you know, that's, this is a real, this is a real thing that is happening and it's going, it's happening more and more and it's going to happen more and more as stats are pointing towards that. Right. Is there anything that you could say to give some, uh, help to parents of how to discuss this say that their child does have this experience and does come to them with it, with this, what are, how do they interact with this and, um, engage in this conversation in a way that doesn't invalidate, that doesn't potentially cause them to lose their child even uh, relationally. Well, I, the first, the first thing that I would say is you've got to be engaging your child to connect with them, to love them, to support them, to find the things that they're good at, and to help them pursue their skills, even if it's something you don't aren't interested in, or you've got to connect with your kid because he or she's your kid. You love them, right? And so, and the reason that's important is there are so many other aspects of life and engagement that organize your relationship other than this thing, this big thing, but this thing. So if they come to you and your child's like, hey, I think I'm the opposite gender we've got to have the emotional maturity as parents this is a different conversation but it, i want to say we have to have the emotional maturity to regulate our own emotion emotions in that moment it is not our child's job to take care of our insecurities or fears it's ours we have to know how to regulate ourselves and that kind of work happens before we ever get to these conversations now look if it has not and you've had these conversations and you freaked out let's hit a reset button but and this is what this is what it looks like even with the reset um you regulate yourself and you look at your child in the eyes and say i love you help me understand what's going on what when you think about the anatomy of our experiences What's going on in your body? What's going on emotionally? Um, what, are, what thoughts are you having? What are you doing? What do you want to do? Is this happening in, an, in a particular environment? What are the circumstances where your experience is? Are there things that have happened to you that have kind of set you up for this? Have people said things about you? Said, told you who you were in the past and, and it kind of stuck with you what they said? That's the anatomy of an experience. I'm now helping my child work through. If they had the courage to tell me, I don't jump straight to the identity like the world. I help them start giving a language to the experience. As scary as it may be, as mm. tough as it may be, I yeah. love you. I'm here to walk with you through this experience. And we'll get the help. We'll we'll get whatever we need. We'll, we'll be supportive. Like, bud, you're... 
you're you're a boy, you're a young man, and what you're experiencing is things that are typically considered to be feminine. That doesn't mean you're a girl. It means that you're interested in these things. Help me understand what about that feels like you're female. Now, they may start talking about their bodies. I feel like I'm born in the wrong body. I feel like, okay, I hear, okay, let's talk through that. And I think at that point, the second thing I'd say is love your kid, help them articulate what they're really experiencing, be a safe place for them. It's okay to get the right help. Have like, if your kid's old enough, read Dr. Deborah. So S O H Dr. Deborah. So the end of gender. There's a, a great resource, great resource. One of my mentors, Dr. Mark Yarhouse is a part of this but it's uh, the Center for um, Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. The website's centerforfaith.com. Mm-hmm. Center, F-O-R, for faith.com. Dr. Preston Sprinkle. There's just so many great resources on there that help parents. Um, teen series, like all sorts of stuff that helps kids work through and think through. And it doesn't minimize the experience like we're sending them off to some anti-gay camp or anti-gender, right. you know, camp or or like yeah. conversion therapy it, it's none of that it, it yeah it's just helping and you can get those kinds of resources and i think as the broader church rallying around and loving people is not the same thing as agreeing with them mm-hmm. and so being able to help navigate and be a support to parents while they're walking through that is 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 um is really important and so i think parents will, will want me to say no this is exactly what you do There are aspects, I'm saying validate the experience, move them away from just a a meaning being assigned to that and help them explore that, spend time processing that. Um, A boy can be in theater and not be gay. A boy can Mm -hmm. be in theater, be attracted to other boys and not identify as gay because it's an experience he's choosing not to identify with. So there's something powerful there's something powerful about whenever, whenever you identify yourself as something, whenever you, whenever you go from, man, I've been, you know, I've been attracted to guys. Like there's a difference between that experience and saying I am gay. Is that yeah. kind of what you're pointing yes. towards? Yep. Huge, huge difference. So, yeah. Um, and what we're doing as we're helping our kids talk about those experiences is we're actually helping them foster the spiritual discipline of confession. The word mm-hmm. homologous, it means to say the same thing or to acknowledge the experiences that we're having. Now, a lot of times people think of it as sin, but just because your kid's having these experiences doesn't mean they've sinned. It means right. they're trying to articulate what's going on in their soul, in their body, and they need a place to say it out loud. And by do, there's a reason why it's so powerful in the church is we're aware of it. And the more we're able to foster an awareness of it, we're able to understand, process more effectively instead of just labeling it. Yeah. I think so as far as a parent and a child, just for parents out there, I think it's really good. It, it's There's not always like a clear cut way to do it, but there's a mindset in, in dealing with it. And I feel like that's what you just kind of articulated is like, don't freak out. Uh, ask some questions. Try to help them put words to their thoughts and their feelings uh, realize that these are ex- real experiences and they're real feelings, but it doesn't mean that uh, they're necessarily needing to make those identifying statements. You know, I, I, that's why a lot of people are, are really concerned with people who are Christians saying that they are a gay Christian rather than saying they're a Christian who struggles with same sex attraction. Because there's something about identifying yourself as something that is very powerful in your own, in your own heart, in your own yep. mind, in your own mentality. Uh, you know, it's kind of like saying, "I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner." It's like, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I am a, I am, a, I am new, a new creation in Christ. I'm in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's how I identify yeah. myself, not as a rank yep. sinner. There's something powerful about that. You are you're stating things about your yourself. Um, I well, don't know. I mean, that's that's it, what I kind of hear whenever you're that's talking exactly. about exactly. It's a it's a principle for me. Like it's one of the while there's a lot of great things about like AA, for example. 
I, what I don't like about mm -hmm. AA, one of the things I'm not a fan of is, hi, I'm Andy, and I'm an alcoholic. Because AA will say, yeah. no, if you don't identify with it, you'll forget about your past. It's like, actually, that's not. Yeah. I can choose to not forget about my past without identifying that that's who I still am. Hi, I'm Andy, and I dealt with alcoholism. That's an experience. Right. That, I'm not saying I'm an alcoholic. It's like, I don't No, I, I'm Andy. I've dealt with alcoholism. I'm going to choose not to go back and drink because of the alcoholism. But mm -hmm. this is who I am today. I'm a husband and a father that shows up for his family now. I'm a, yeah. you know, those declarations of identity, I think, are way more important. And so it's one of the reasons why I think, again, that ideological faction of this goes after identity. Because right. once you identify, it takes a lot to de-identify, a lot to deconstruct. Mm. That's what people have to do if they've been in that community, identified in that community, and now there's a deconstruction yeah. process. So it almost takes more courage to de-identify than it does to identify. Because yes, once you've does. changed teams or you know whatever, whenever you've done that, you've taken that huge step. Now you're like, I got to go back on what I said. So it's almost harder the second yep. time. The question would be, when it comes to trauma, dealing with trauma, how much value is there in um, revisiting the past? How long should someone dwell, meditate, think on, rehash what has happened in the past? Uh, and can that at some point begin to inhibit someone from moving forward uh, because of potentially – you know, always revisiting the past in order to try to heal and move forward. Does that make oh, sense? Oh, absolutely. I, I think there's, so there's a relationship between healing from the past and moving into your future. And both have to happen, but you can get people that get preoccupied with healing from my past that I, I just stay in the past looking for things to heal from. Or you can get so preoccupied yeah. with moving forward that you're dragging a bunch of baggage around, not dealing with the things that you need to. So the best way that I can articulate it is to say we heal from, but we also heal towards. Deal with what you need to in the past, but keep an eye on your future, your mission, your vision, things that are bigger than just the trauma of our past, things that really identify who we are and why we were created that we're, there's a purpose towards move towards connection, move towards thriving, move towards understanding how to foster positive emotions and why that's so important. Move towards things, heal towards things. And don't let your entire identity be wrapped up in one aspect of who you are, like sexuality and gender. I realize it's a big deal. It's a sacred area of life. But when we can buffer who we are by other forms of healthy identity, it helps us work through these other things more effectively. What would be one indicator of someone who may be, quote unquote, stuck in the past? As an example, like for me, I feel like there's been times in my life where I was something happened and I'm working through it and I feel like I'm moving forward. And then all of a sudden there's a moment where I feel like I've kind of I'm circling that same tree. Like, okay, wait, I've already, I've already had this conversation. I've already heard this, um, this input from, from a person or I got counsel or I had a prayer or whatever it is. I, and now I'm, I feel like I'm kind of stuck in this cycle of, I'm no longer healing forward. I feel like I'm just going around in circles with this traumatic experience or this, uh, relational, uh, this relationship that broke down or whatever it is is that is that kind of like an indicator that hey, okay, I'm going around around this tree over and over uh, or is that not a you know that's kind of the kind of the indicator I'm thinking of yeah that, I, I think that could be a part of it so there's kind of a three prong so it, if you one of the best ways to break the power of the past is to deal with it, its implications in the present so you can go back and deal with trauma EMDR um you know, you'll hear church people talk about go back and deal with the root cause. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. I, I get it. 
I, I, I see that. But sometimes you get so preoccupied with the root cause that you just stay in the past. Like something's going on from the past. It's like, actually we've worked, we've prayed through that. We've done EMDR. You don't feel the same weight, but there's sometimes a mental preoccupation with it. Cause you get reminded of whatever it's like time out, remind yourself of the healing process. Ask yourself, what can I do to take responsibility for the here and now to be healthy? And what can I do that is moving me towards a vision for my future? And so as long as you're still connected to the mission and vision for where you're headed, you're taking responsibility to be healthy right now. It's okay to periodically go back to the past and deal with things just as long as there's a balance there. Yeah. The last question would be this. What would you say to someone who is wrestling with gender confusion? What, what would be something that you would say directly to them to maybe help them think through this, process through this for their own life, uh, and maybe even like a next step for them? I, this, this isn't necessary in a, necessarily in a particular order. But one, I would say that um, I would apologize just as the church, if the church hasn't been a safe place to talk about the experience. And I, I would say there are people out there and you're one of them that's open to sitting down and listening to understand, um, but, but find a place where, where you believe that people can listen to understand you, not just within the community, within the LGBTQ plus community. But if you listen to this it's probably because you're interested in faith and integrating your faith and you're trying to figure this thing out, find people who are willing to just listen and lean in and be present with you in the Christian uh, community. The second thing is don't be afraid to give a true language to the experience before you prematurely identify with a, with a label or a term. Get a really good handle on what the heck is going on with me and lean in, be, be, it's not just an emotional decision. It's an intellectual one. Lean in and study, work to figure this thing out. Um, understand the meaning that is being applied to your experiences in your own life and by others and where that meaning is coming from. What are the sources of meaning? Because there's sometimes people want you to identify with your experiences because it validates theirs. And that's not a good enough reason. So lean in and pay attention. And as you pursue this thing, understand what is your foundational source of meaning and purpose. And as a Christ follower, somebody that really believes that there's more to this life than just our sexuality and gender. And I say this with compassion, not fully understanding this part, you know, the people who experience this, but as a Christ follower saying, um, he is worth leaning into. Jesus is worth leaning into and just start there. Start with Jesus. He is waiting with his arms open wide and see, see him in the midst of this journey. And let's see what happens from there. I think a lot of times we're looking for like that silver bullet. We're looking for that one clean cut answer. And I think the reality is that with this, with this discussion, there is not one clear cut answer. There's not one clear cut um, approach or story. I think, that there is a a struggle of how the church is supposed to let's say that you have heard someone's story let's let's say you have gone gone with them on the journey uh let's say that a person they they do have you know gender dysphoria let's say that they they're at the spot where they're like i am going to begin to live as another gender getting to the the biblical side uh, there is a part a point a point where it says okay what does it look like to live for the lord to submit your sexuality uh, once you've gone through all of the types of approaches and things like what does it look like for me as a transgender person to actually live for God? Does it mean that I, if I'm a guy, if I'm a biological male and I want to live as a female, does living a submitted life to God mean me not presenting myself as a female, me not going as 
you know, female pronouns, me not uh, uh, transitioning into that lifestyle, but remaining living out a lifestyle that's aligned with my biological sex in regards to my identity and everything else. I mean, what would you say to that? I, I would say you've got to give people permission to be on a journey. Holly Wagner. Mm -hmm. I, I just had the opportunity to meet Holly Wagner. Um, she and her hu husband, Philip pastored in uh, Los Angeles for years. And, um, she told a story years ago that, uh, she said, you know, we had a, a guy who was, um, more than likely transgendered, but, um, you know, back then in the 90, I forget when it was, but probably nineties or two thousands, uh, just w we would, would have been considered a trans transvestite, right. Or, or a cross dresser, or mm -hmm. different people use different terms yeah. then and now, but, um, get saved, justified weeks go by. He's still dressing like a woman. Well, what would we do with that? We tell yeah. him behaviorally, bro, you got to start dressing like a man. Well, Okay. But maybe I, there's a little bit of an imposition of our own cultural values there. But what if we just had the patience to let God do a work? We kept talking about faith. We focused on what was important. Holly said after weeks, it may have been a few months of coming to the church, he walks up to her and he goes, you know, I've been praying and the Holy Spirit told me I just I, I need to stop wearing high heels. And she said, okay. She said, I thought to myself, I might would have started with the red lipstick, but <laughs> hey, okay, I hear you. Like that, just trust the Lord. It just gave him room to yep. enter and walk through the sanctification process. And I, I think we get so hung up on where people are right now, and they've got to do this thing right now. And I'm, that's why I think so much of this is led by the Holy Spirit. And people are like, oh, we're not. We're, yeah. If we so rigidly enforce these laws, that we we're missing the opportunity to walk people into what's really important, and that's teaching them how to hear the Holy Spirit for themselves, how to engage God for themselves, how to lean in and do. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't set boundaries. Like, I'm probably not going to a gay bar with somebody just to connect with them, right? Right. I, you know, I'm. It's not going to happen. I'll connect with them somewhere else if I need to over coffee or sit down and we're talking. Hey, here, let's talk about the Lord. Let's talk about experiences. How are you doing today? Like, but there's a boundary there. Um, if I have a family member, for example, who says I'm going to live this lifestyle and they're out doing things that put them at risk, I may have to set a boundary where, look, you can't be around my kids right now. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's like my, my mom had to do that with my uncle related to drugs. I love you, but you're doing things that could put us in danger or at risk. I, you just can't be around my kids right now. And yeah. so that's a boundary. You may have to set boundaries based on conviction, but you can still, boundaries are meant to be uh, tools for self-care. And they're the, they should be the least restrictive boundary necessary for us to continue to practice holistic self-care and operate from a place of conviction, but also love. So I'm going to set mm -hmm. the least restrictive. Uh, <laughs> there's a, uh, <laughs> a multicolored balloons right there. The celebrator. Um, uh, we're going to, I'm going to set the least restrictive boundaries necessary to live in my conviction, but I still love and care about you want to connect how I can. And let me say this, if you're listening and I haven't upset you so much, and I want to say something to the, to the person trying to live out an opposite gender lifestyle or the person living a, a same sex or homosexual or gay LGBTQ plus lifestyle, give your family some grace just because they set boundaries. Now, Obviously, if they're cruel, they say, screw you, we hate you, like, that's terrible. And I'm sorry that's happening to you. But if you see that your family's doing the best they can to set boundaries with you but still love you, give them some grace. You may be mad at them, frustrated with them. I can appreciate that. But if you notice that they're trying to stay connected with you at all, meet them there. Don't reject them. Hmm. I, I've seen regret on that side of the aisle as well. And so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as we wrap this up, I think it's just, again, uh, it's good to just acknowledge the complexity of this. 
uh, and not just say it's complex and then not actually engage in meaningful dialogue about how to work through it. I think that's where a lot of people are. It's just, man, it's so complex. I'm just not going right. to even try. And I, I don't think that's helpful. Um, I think it is important to say that in the same way that you described in the church, in, in church world, um, that, uh, you know, if we were to, if we were to apply the same mindset to allowing the Holy spirit to work on people, uh, like as we do with someone who struggles with alcohol or, uh, or maybe they're, they're living together outside of marriage with someone, or maybe they struggle with lying or any other type of, of whether, you know, if what we deem to be sin biblically, and we would look at someone who is living out this lifestyle where we, you know, whether it's cross dressing or whatever, and we would say, we don't feel like that is in alignment with what the word of God portrays, uh, and we might believe that repentance would look like eventually needing to, uh, you know, begin to dress or act and, and go back to your biological sex and the gender that's attached to that. You know what I'm saying? Um, the timeline of when that's appropriate or the timeline of when that is needs to, and I say this not meaning I, it needs to be done, but needs to be enforced on someone, right? That What's that timeline? It has to be the same approach equally and and we also as the, as the church have to be careful not to allow fear to attach itself to us and say because someone is in our midst okay in a part of our church that is dealing with something uh that that automatically means that the sky is falling that our kids are going to be uh completely right. wrapped up in this mindset and now we've got to exclude an entire group of people because we don't want a little bit of leaven to leaven yeah. the whole I th loaf type bro, of mindset. I think mindset. that's a pseudo-spiritual perspective that has kept us from connecting and loving people well. I think I think it's fueled by fear yep. as well. I mean, that's for me, that's, yeah. that's what I would It's a psychological defense it. that's it's, just got a spiritual overlay to it. Yeah. So there's probably a whole other conversation we could have about that, but we're not. <laughs> we're going to wrap it up. Hey, and, thank you. Uh, you know, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I appreciate you taking this amount of time. And I know that this is close to your heart and something that you deal with a lot. And I appreciate you being a resource to, to me and to our church. And hopefully this is a resource for other people to work through some yeah. of these difficult ideas. Yeah. You know, I want to say this really quickly. If any of my friends who are part of the LGBTQ community hear this, listen to this, I want you to hear me say I love you. And I'm for you. I want you to thrive. I want you to experience the fullness of what Jesus has for you. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen all the way through. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, man. Love you. Appreciate you. And uh, we'll yes, catch indeed. you next time. Thanks, brother.